Thank you very much um, for joining us uh, at today's DSSC Insight Series. Um, my name is Francisca and I'm very much looking forward uh, to moderate the third DSSC Insight Series today. And it is great to have you all, uh, all of you with us this afternoon. And I especially welcome our guests, uh, Sylvia Castelvi, presenting the OpenBI position papers results, Dolores Ordonez and Juan Arenas. Dolores will present the work on the preparatory action for the tourism data space, and Juan presents the genomic data infrastructure project. So thank you very much for being here today. Uh, and before I hand over to Boris for his presentation on the value of data spaces, I would like to announce the upcoming data space support center annual conference that is embedded into the symposium and take place uh, from the 21st to the 23rd of March in The Hague. So what we would also like to do and will do is um, post the registration link into the chat um, so that you can all register and we are very much looking forward to welcoming the, you there. We have a great lineup um, with great presenters and speakers from industry, uh, politics and um, other initiatives. Yes, so thank you very much. And with this, I would like to hand over to you, Boris, uh, for your presentation. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you for the introduction, Francisca. I'm sharing my screen, just a second, uh, so that I can basically share my slides with you. Uh, could everybody who's not speaking go to mute mode? Because I have, let's say, a back bit of a noisy background. I'm not so sure whether that is myself, but if everybody could go on mute, that would be appreciated. Otherwise, I will just start, okay? Um, right. Um, yeah, so please, now it's better. Now it's much better. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Right, so um, talking about the value of data spaces is, of course, um, only uh, the logical next steps, let's call it like that. When we um, remember that last time, um, we talked a little bit about, of course, what is the DSCC doing in general? And also we talked about what um, data spaces actually are. And um, of course, they are not an end in itself, but they are a means to a certain end because they want to create innovation and make the life of um, people better, but also provide business benefits to, well, to companies and organizations. And that is why it's um, useful and also needed um, to look into the value creation that data spaces bring about. Um, because as we know right now, um, the creation of data spaces is taken up to speed. And um, if we are unable altogether to reply to the question, well, what's in for me, then it will probably be a hard time, let's face it. Um, <clears throat> so once more, um, I would like to start with um, an update of a example data space, um, one that you should already know, because I think I used this example in one of the, the last times. This is the mobility data space which was um, which went live um, almost one and a half years ago um, in Germany, but um, has the ambition to also team up and line up with um, and, think, uh, and be interoperable with, with other um, European mobility endeavors, for example, Iona X. And what you can see here is that you basically through the data space are able to connect different stakeholders, stakeholder groups in the mobility domain. For me, I'm always using mobility because it's really a nice domain because there's it's where everybody comes together, right? I mean, you have um, the large corporations, for example, automobile um, manufacturers, like on the lower right-hand side. Um, you have, let's say, insurance companies, for example. You have, let's say, um, uh, local um, transport organizations. Um, you have, let's say, other mobility service providers like train operators. And of course, you have ourselves, us as the mobile travelers. Um, and that is basically where the data economy really brings together all different kinds of stakeholder groups. And all of these um, <clears throat> stakeholder groups would be connected to the mobility data space in order, for example, um, to provide um, intermodal end-to-end -end mobility services that cover 
the entire mobility chain, starting, for example, with a local bus, um, going then to a, I don't know, a local train service, um, to a, let's say, um, national train service, um, airlines, hotel chains, ride sharing companies. And all of the, those need to uh, be brought together, need to be orchestrated in order to provide a, well, uh, the optimal, let's say, service experience to customers like, like I am, and probably many of you are also, because you also travel a lot, I assume. And um, we have also discussed the other day that none of these service providers that we are, um, yeah, that we are in, in business with, um, usually has um, all the data available that is needed to provide one with these um, orchestrated mobility chains. So the logical consequences, these guys need to team up, but also we must um, allow them to use our data um, under certain conditions. For example, um, it would be useful for me if let's say Lufthansa would also have access on my travel plans and know which train I'm taking because in cases that um, the train is delayed um, and I would probably, and, and, and thus would, I would miss my flight, Lufthansa could already automatically book me on another flight, right? So that's something which would be good for me because I don't end up with the hustle to do the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the booking change um, on myself and would not end up, let's say, sitting in front of the gate where um, the plane has already left. So that would be good. And I would need to allow everybody to use my data and these uh, companies need to share this data. Right? Um, so <clears throat> what we also see in this example is, as I mentioned, that there's a variety of, let's say, stakeholder groups um, involved and not only on the, let's say, <clears throat> at, the, at, the, at the end user service um, 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 side, but also when it comes to, well, who is providing the data? Um, you can see that here on the left-hand side with the data provider. <clears throat> but on top of that, there are providers of data apps, for example. Um, for example, um, there is another um, platform in, in Germany, the um, Mobility Data Marketplace, which basically bundles certain kinds of um, publicly available data. Or there are... Um, um, data apps that enrich data, for example, or assure data quality. And then we have, let's say, usually business app providers, which offer functionality that helps companies out in their endeavor to, well, to optimize business processes, for example, or offer new services by themselves. Um, I mentioned the Catena X example the other day, and this capacity and demand planning that is pretty important in the automotive value chain is something that always needs to be optimized and optimization algorithms could be offered um, through domain specific, well, business app service providers. And on the other hand, you have the app users. So companies that engage with the data space, be it members or just consuming services out of it, app users, if you may, and you also um, have, let's say, a group of, of stakeholders which are not using an app, but just want to get the data because they, well, they want to uh, process, analyze it on their own, um, be it under, let's say, um, policy management rules or not. Um, and then we also have, let's say, providers of um, enabling services, for example, um, as our spin-off, you might have heard of it, Sovety Connector as a Service Solutions or consulting services that um, enable companies to connect to a data space. And of course, there is the data space owner. And that is something that I mentioned also the other day that um, these ecosystems, well, need to have a home, right? I mean, so if you, for example, look into the health x data loft um, project that is the community and um, they are also of course in the process of, of of thinking okay how can we institutionalize ourselves because if somebody has a question um, with regard to that data space um, what's the phone number to call to speak in the words of Henry Kissinger of course and usually <clears throat> on the lowest part um, the data space owner typically is not let's say the same entity that runs 
the software services that provide the infrastructure for the data space. This is usually um, contracted to a specialist um, cloud service provider, for example. So when we talk about the value of, um, of, uh, of data spaces, we uh, need to um, look at this from the different perspectives of the data of the stakeholders involved in the data space. And I tried to um, uh, yeah, summarize this a little bit here. You can see on the left-hand side of this table, the roles that are just introduced. As I said, I tried to be to a certain extent generic so that they would apply for not only one data space, but let's say uh, the majority of those that we find out there. Um, then I basically um, have here in the second column, the, the well, the business model type that they, that they try to pursue. Um, for example, the data provider probably has a domain specific business model could be like, well, I'm, my job is to produce cars, for example, or my job is to treat patients, for example, or it could also be a data business, of course, right? And if we go down the list, um, <clears throat> a data user, if we stick with the mobility example, could be, um, yeah, for example, a smart city, a municipality that wants to use um, floating car data in order to optimize their, well, their, their, their you know, their, their parking control systems, for example. I come to this example because uh, the city of Dortmund just recently um, set their new parking guidance systems um, productive. So, and um, the business model of the data space owner is one that is laid out in the Data Governance Act. So as a data sharing service intermediary as in Article 11. And then um, as mentioned, the operators of data space core services are the typical IT service providers. And if we now then look into, okay, what is the value contribution of the data space as such? We see that it differs from these groups, which is of course not surprising, but that is the, the exercise that we have to do. For the data provider, well, this is some sort of a sales or distribution channel for their data, right? Um, also a means for data sharing, because if somebody is just, let's say, not in, let's say, the data business, but as I said, as a domain-specific um, <clears throat> participant, then they want to share data in order to get something in return, right? And that's the value. Um, then we have, let's say, data app providers and business app providers, and that is similar to what we know from the consumer world. I mean, if I am an app developer and uh, use the, the Apple ecosystem, then of course I have to pay a lot of, let's say, fees to Apple. But on the other hand, I have high scale up potential. Um, right. And we can go down the list and so on and so forth. I need to speed up a little bit in order to not steal too much time from the others in the group. And what I want to, um, let's say, uh, close with is to give you an overview now we have understood well how let's say the different value propositions uh, data space gives to stakeholders are then we should in the next steps and that is also um, looking into the next uh, inside webinar uh, having a better understanding about the data value creation process that is underneath and what i tried here i used some some oecd um, framework um, and this contains the usual data value chain, like the green chunks here in the middle, and um, also looks into, well, okay, you need to um, combine data from various internal and external sources, but um, you also need to share the data because then the value is increased. And what we should do is really look into this in greater detail in the DSSC in order to make sure that we understand the value creation activities and also let's say data sovereignty and policy management, not between one, uh, between two participants, but along a data value chain. And with that, that I'd like to stop here and handing uh, back the word to Francisca. Thank you very much, Boris. Um, and um, as I, I see that we have a question um, in, in the chat coming from the French Ministry for Higher Education and Research. Um, Mr. Volker Beckmann, he says, you seem to address only interests of the private sector, whereas I had assumed that the data spaces shall also enable and accelerate public research. Can you comment? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, very, very good question. Um, and actually, that's what we do. Um, there are a lot of, let's say, um, public research activities going on. For example, EUSC, we all know 
in Germany, there is this counterpart like the National Research Data Infrastructure I'm also um, involved with. Um, and we also have projects ongoing with try to um, combine both design principles because the for the public research domain, the design principle is fairness uh, in, in, in terms of the fair principle, so openness in the end. Whereas in the private sector, the one of the key design principles is control, right? <clears throat> I think that is not, let's say, conflicting, and there are chances to bring it together. And this is also a necessity because in many domains, um, public and private research are um, walk hand in hand. If I look into healthcare, pharmaceutical, for example, but also material science, and therefore, of course, we need to look at, into this as well. Great, thank you very much. And with this, I would like to hand over Sylvia to you for presenting the OpenDI position paper results. Thank you, Francesca. Let thank me share my screen. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to present the, the results from OpenDI uh, on the position paper, maybe, yeah. I don't know if I can take off this. Okay. And this uh, this paper is uh, is the second phase of the design principles position paper, where we were uh, went into deep on on the building blocks. You for all of you that are not familiar with this uh, paper. Um, the design principles position paper was um, published uh, on, on the framework of the project OpenDI. And this paper provides uh, first um, guidelines on how to design uh, data spaces following uh, FAIR um, European principles. And it was co-created with experts from data spaces, but also from different uh, sectors that participate on OpenDI project. And with this paper, we provide the foundations for data spaces in Europe, based on data sovereignty and interoperability, and also to ensure the mass adoption of and scalability of the data spaces and they should be sector agnostic. And also we designed it, defined it that they should be developed in a coordinated way, providing technological, functional, operational, and also legal aspects. And we highlighted on this paper also the need for agreements and standardize on building blocks. And we, the, so we saw on this paper that there was a lack on, on the knowledge of these uh, building blocks. And we identified that uh, we need to, to go uh, deeper or investigate. These building blocks and the design principles and the building blocks has been the base for several projects, proposals, and initiatives in, in Europe in research in Europe, but also the Data Space Support Center uh, is considering these building blocks. Um, these 12 building blocks are, um, can be classified in two types. One, the technical building blocks and also the governance building blocks. The, the technical building blocks or these building blocks can be categorized in four categories. The first category provides interoperability to, to the data spaces, defining a common format uh, for data models specification, also how um, sharing and exchanging data between uh, data spaces participants, ensuring semantic interoperability, and also allowing or facilitating provenance and traceability of the shared data. Also, this, uh, there is a second category that provides trust, uh, data sovereignty on, on, on the data spaces, allowing the participants to be uh, authenticated and author authorized, and also enforcing the access and the usage control to the, to the data uh, through data policies, usage policies, and also uh, ensuring data sharing and exchange between participants in a trustworthiness way. 
And then we have another important uh, category that is the data value creation. And here we identify uh, three building blocks that provides or enables the publication of the data sets, the data offering. And also we facilitate the, the accounting of the data usage inside the data space and other uh, solutions and technologies that provides a directory or broker facilitating the access or publication of data assets in order to, to discover it and, and using it. Another important category is the governance of the data spaces. Here we identify at high level that uh, cooperation agreements are needed on data spaces, but also how to regulate uh, policies to regulate uh, the, the operation of the data spaces and also organizational agreements or aspects related data spaces. In order to go deeper on, on this identified building blocks on the design principles, uh, we started a second iteration of the task force that consists on a survey in order to communicate with our community and data capture between the project that or initiative that are already started to implement these building blocks. The, the methodology that we use was um, publishing the survey for data capturing, but also organizing workshops in order to get directly from the experts the, the feedback. All this information is, uh, was uh, collected in a, in a document, the Open Day State of the Art, that is um, a first approach or, or um, preliminary, preliminary work in order to evaluate the building blocks that should be further evaluated on, on the data spaces support center. And also we start the creation of a building blocks catalog. Um, in this document, you will find uh, for each building block, uh, the identification of the building blocks, the definition, but also we collected from several projects, not all, it's not an exhaustive uh, mapping, but you will find some preliminary implementations and business cases from diverse projects and initiatives, requirements from these implementations, and also uh, recommendations from the Data Spaces Business Alliance on the technical converse document that is aligned with these building blocks. Here you can see the table of of content of these documents that um, a part of providing uh, more information regarding each of the 12 building blocks, we provide some insights why uh, these building blocks are useful for, for data spaces deployment. And also we provide um, insights about uh, what means data spaces instance of the building blocks when we have the, the building blocks is not enough. We need a process, we need an architecture that guide us how to merge these building blocks in order to create data spaces instance. So we explain uh, here uh, a little bit about it. And then um, we explain how um, different initiatives, we, we identify different initiatives that are contributing to the building blocks and we, we provide some results regarding some questions about how to harmonize data spaces. Okay, uh, regarding the, the governance building blocks, there is a lot of work to, to do. Uh, in this paper, we present a first approach in order to identify uh, different layers that are required in order to governance the data spaces. Uh, we identify four layers. Uh, the first layer is the, the governance of the soft infrastructure, how to governance these building blocks in order to instantiate uh, these building blocks in a data space. And then we need to identify how to govern uh, data spaces or intra data spaces inside the data spaces. Because in a second level, in each domain, in, in each sector, we have our rules, we have our regulations and best practice that should be implemented. And then we, we have another layer of governance. And on the top, 
we have the, the data spaces initiatives guidelines such as GAIA-X, BDBA or IDSA. And also we have the public private data governance and the regulations. And this uh, gives us to, to we identify in this paper the need of identify how to make interoperable uh, data spaces between different data spaces. Here we introduce um, what is uh, the, the necessity of the intra data space interoperability that every data space should uh, decide and align. But then we need to identify how to make the data spaces um, in the same sector, but al also cross sectorial interoperable. And finally, uh, we presented the, um, the results of the survey in a, in a GitHub in order to create a first catalog with the, the answers from the participants on the survey. So here on the QRL, you can, uh, QR, you can access to this GitHub building block catalog where you will find all the detailed information that we found. And for each building block, you can uh, you can find which is the role and the scope of the building block, the features, components, and technologies, implementation, reference implementation, use case, and requirement. This is just, as I said, a starting point for further development, not only on data space support center. There are CSAs, for example, dates to this data space that uh, Dolores is going to present later, and also mobility data mobility CSA that is going to work on identifying building blocks at sectorial level. Thank you for the attention and if you have questions or comments. Yes, thank you very much, Sylvia, for the presentation. And indeed, we have one question um, that is, shouldn't next to data models and formats, Ontologies and vocabularies also form part of the interoperability building blocks. Maybe you can answer this. Uh, I cannot see the question. Wh which is the question? Sorry, I didn't. Is, is... Uh, maybe you can just uh, reply to the question. Ah, okay, the, I will reply. Yes. Um, as we are, uh, yeah, as time, time always flies in these uh, webinars. We would then continue with the uh, with the next presentation, and I would like Dolores to um, yeah to present. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santiska. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to share my screen. So when Sylvia, okay. Now, can you see my screen? Right. Yes, we can. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to present here the European Data Space uh, for Tourism. It's a CSA. And of course, um, we are very uh, happy to, to be coordinated with the Data Space Support Center in order not to generate overlappings or not, not to duplicate. So I think it's very important because we are speaking about efficiency, which is a word that we repeat many times. But when we are discussing about tourism, we have to think that uh, tourism is one of the industries that uh, consumes but also generates huge amount of data and for Europe it's an important uh, element not only because of the impact that, that it has in uh, the internal GDP but also because uh, Europe it's a, a worldwide leader in, in tourism and this means that uh, we are uh, tackling a lot of different stakeholders along the tourism value chain which is uh, very complex um, indeed uh, um, at the beginning, it has been mentioned as, a, as an example, the, the mobility uh, data space, which we consider as, as an important part also of the tourism data space. So we really need to generate also these synergies, not only among the own uh, tourism value chain, but also with other data spaces. And in this regard, um, our project uh, wants to pro, uh, study or analyze these approaches uh, to for this development, development of this secure and trusted um, tourism data space. But what is important for us, it's also to be aligned with the pillars that uh, are uh, being mentioned in, in, the, in the last period. And we don't have to forget that, that we are coming in a period um, after COVID in which uh, tourism was the most uh, hated industry. For that, uh, competitiveness, resilience, and sustainability are key pillars that are going to be um, covering or, or um, 
uh, along all the process in which we are going to build this uh, tourism uh, data space. Uh, what is important for us is that when we um, started defining the proposal, we are a large consortia for a very small project of uh, 13 partners, uh, we re representing the public and private sector, that is, as a question mentioned before, so the National Ministry of Tourism of Italy is one of the official partners of the proposal, but uh, we had a, an enlargement consortia in, in the terms that we got more than 50 support letters from different actors all across Europe, from which seven national ministries and also the main important networks in tourism that were supporting our uh, submission. And when we are going to, um, uh, to define the activity that we are implementing, um, we are um, now working in this common governance, understanding which is the, this ecosystem not to left anyone behind, especially the ESMIs, which are an important part of the uh, tourism ecosystem. Almost 80% of the business ecosystem in the tourism sector are ESMIs. So therefore we have to take care about how they are going to benefit for a data, from a data space. Also, what is very important is to define the rules, how the data is going to be shared, which are going to be the win-win situations, and how we are going to generate the frameworks in which we will generate benefits also for the territories and all the entities that are involved. Uh, the, in our blueprint that we have to deliver at the end of the project, we really need to identify which are those uh, technical and non-technological requirements. So um, as Silvia has mentioned, we are working in the, the identification of the different uh, building blocks. And of course, as, as it has been mentioned, to incorporate resilience and sustainability. And when you see the triangle, which is uh, on the other way around, it's because um, we have the European Union and we know how, how the hierarchy uh, works. But at the level of tourism, the tourism is not an European policy. So the member states have, haven't given the competences to the European Union to regulate on tourism. So this means that depending on the country, the competencies to manage the tourism industry is a different level. And most of them are can be found only at regional or even local level. And this is very important to when we are constructing the, the, the data space. Our expectations is to generate this uh, recommendation and guiding for, for constructing uh, the, the tourism data space. But of course, what is very important is to generate a strong ecosystem in which all the main actors are involved so, and as has been mentioned at the beginning, not to reinvent the world, and therefore we are working with the data space support center and also to see which are the synergies with all the data, uh, data space support. And for this, we really need to, to exchange and to learn from the things that are being done in other uh, data spaces. But uh, what is also important here is uh, how can we connect the data providers and the data consumers? And what is really important is the word uh, new added value. So it is not just a matter to start gathering data or to share data because it, it's nice to share data, but we have to generate uh, new added value. And for the main actors in the tourism ecosystem, it is very important to identify which is the business model behind these uh, the data sharing initiatives. And uh, when we see at the beginning, which is the chain, and uh, we have the data providers, the mediators, and the data consumers in the tourism value chain, Another new stakeholders are appearing in the, in the data management uh, ecosystem, which we have also to map and to see which is going to be the role. So therefore, an important part of our project is also to identify which are the different roles of the different stakeholders and which are the main interactions that are happening among them. Uh, we have a lot of uh, use case examples uh, um, have been mentioned with the airport because uh, at the end everybody is, is traveling and we, we always face problems at the airport with losing uh, flights. But then we arrive into the hotel and we arrive to, to a destination. Um, we, we want to enjoy the experience uh, visiting different places and also to test the local products. But then we have to identify this added value. And this added value could be related to increasing the, the, tourist, the tourist satisfaction or generate new tourism experience, or how are we going to save resources or be more sustainable, which is something very important, especially in destinations in which uh, mass tourism, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. And uh, what is very inter in easy to understand is the seamless travel. So this is the typical example that everybody's putting from uh, 
flying to Bruno from to Mallorca and you have to go to Vienna with the train and then you go with the taxi and you are in Vienna, how nice is Vienna, so I have to stop here to go dinner and to see uh, opera, but then I have to go to the airport and then I arrive to Mallorca. So this is the seamless travel in which the the the, the tourist, the visitor, is, is receiving all the information to the mobile and everything is very efficient and they can enjoy that they can go to from one uh, transport to another without any friction. But um, when uh, we go to the reality, what's happening at the level of the destinations, and we have here the hotel and, and the bus, so just to put an example, how they are communicated now. So normally they are calling and they say a name with a number, and sometimes the receptor, they get a, a strong name, a, a grunk name or a grunk uh, number. And sometimes also this information is sent by um, by email, but sometimes with email, all this information has formats that cannot be uh, correctly uh, analyzed or, or gathered. So what we have to introduce is to see how databases are um, used in each of these uh, specific actors, and then to start uh, um, helping them with all these pro uh, processes of ETL, so standardization, and then to see, and, and we have also Sylvia here with uh, IDS, with the, with the connectors, how we are going to, to exchange all this information. And then, uh, of course, which are going to be the benefits. Benefits related to time, time saving, which is very important, to so money, so we are going to generate more economical benefits, or we are going to save money, and efficiencies. And to get this, and um, we, we are working in a, in a framework, so our project will uh, be finished um, at the end of this year. And we are already now working in this part of the governance and defining the part of tech. We have already mapped the different um, uh, data sharing initiatives in the tourism sector. And now we are very concentrated in the technical and non-technical requirements, but also in the governance, which is a trans transversal action uh, that it is going to be very clear. So we are organizing different kind of events uh, to which we want to, to invite you. Also coalition events that are very dedicated and to validate the, the findings that we are um, uh, uh, um, achieving. And then of course, we will have to send to the commission uh, a blueprint. Um, what, what it's important and from the surveys and the different changes that we are having is that um, people don't wear more papers and, and platforms. So what it's very important is to generate something that solve uh, real tourism problems. And since we are uh, creating an open community, what we want is to uh, uh, invite you to become stakeholders. Please visit our website and uh, here you have the possibility to be part of the setting the basis of the European data space for tourism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dolores. Uh, thank you for this great uh, presentation. And in case you have questions to Dolores, please don't hesitate to write them into the Q&A chat or into our chat, and we will make sure to answer them. And now mm -hmm. I'm also happy to have our uh, third guest today with us, uh, Juan, to hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, very glad to be here today. I hope you can see the slides. Yes, um, everything works. Okay, so let me just first start with the um, first a short introduction about what we do in Elixir. So Elixir is a member state organization that, um, well, 23 countries are funding our activities across this, these countries to uh, ensure that we can accelerate the life science research in private and public institutions. We also get easy funding, and what we have been doing in the last uh, more than 10 years is to create European standards that has become also global standards on this area. And now, as a result of that, we are acknowledged as a neutral broker in this space, and that's why we have been coordinating the CSA that is supporting the European uh, data infrastructure and also the implementation project that we just started in November, and it's the one that I'm going to focus the discussions today. Uh, and finally, it's all of these outputs are already out there and being used in, in different projects uh, are also integrated in many uh, life science resources across Europe and has very high output like the COVID-19 data portal that was so relevant during the, the, the COVID period. Uh, so moving into the, the project, the first thing to remember is that this project is here to support the OnePlus initiative. It was signed in 2018 by 13 countries. 
to accelerate the deployment of genomic medicine across Europe. At the moment, uh, up to today, we have 26 countries that are part of the initiative, and the GDA project is really here to realize the data infrastructure that is needed for this to happen. Um, so the, infra the initiative is organized uh, at the European level, where so basically all the all the countries assigned or are that part of the initiative send the experts to one of the 12 working groups that are looking uh, governance, are looking also LC aspect, data quality, data standards, technical infrastructure, industry, and then there is also domain specific use cases looking at cancer, infectious disease, rare diseases, common and complex diseases, and uh, the genome of Europe. So this, this work was basically uh, supported by the member states until we got the CSA, that is the B1G project that will finish uh, in August this year. And that has been basically helping all this uh, discussion to crystallize in recommendations and guidance on these different areas. And that's what we call the one plus trust framework that will be the main output of the project and that we hope to release, to release before summer. Uh, <clears throat> But now we have started also the European Genomic Data Infrastructure. This is the project that is supporting the scale up and sustainability and the main point for the discussions today. Uh, this project, and we will see later, is not in isolation. There is quite a lot of activity uh, in this area and, and it has to be connected with other initiatives and with other projects. And we are doing this through one of the, our use case, the cancer use case, that is connecting this initiative with the uh, European Hata Space and also with the European Cancer Image Initiative that was recently launched in January. Uh, so, so, what is the end of One Plus NG? As I mentioned before, to, we're trying here in, in the initiative to realize the practice of, of genomic medicine into the healthcare system. The project is not getting there because healthcare system is a national responsibility. But other than that, the project is, is there to being able to analyze the data and to generate new knowledge that can go back to treat patients and to improve prevention at the European level. Um, so the aims of the project itself, as I mentioned before, is mostly focused on, on the infrastructure. This is not a CSA anymore. This is a deployment and sc scalability project where we have to uh, actually um, make the infrastructure appear and, and being there to serve the requests of the users. Um, and we are building the outputs of the one plus ng working groups as i mentioned before and the outputs of the one plus the b1ng projects uh, the project itself uh, we have 20 countries um, that are participating say six of the country will be technically operational in 2024 so we, we are running out of time already <laughs> it's quite a lot of work to do in, in very little time but we are very uh, hopeful that that will happen uh, and then we, was, we we aim to have 15 countries fully connected to the infrastructure before the end of the project. Um, so looking at the project governance, there is, I highlighted there the one of the components on the advice and monitoring uh, that we have, which is the One Plus NG partner projects and the stakeholder forum. Particularly the stakeholder forum is, is open to anyone to contribute. And what we have been doing in B1NG is, is basically uh, circulating all the public deliverable before they were submitted to the commission for uh, input from the stakeholders. I think at the moment we have more than 260 stakeholder registered. And this again is completely open. If anyone wants to be aware of what's happening and contribute, uh, they, can, they can use that channel for that. And there is a, a slide at the end that will provide the links. Um, the project itself is organized across three pillars. Uh, the first one is looking at the sustainability, the infrastructure, and the new solutions. Uh, looking into the details, the pillar one uh, is basically answering three different questions. One is what needs to be sustained after the end of the project? What part of the infrastructure will have to be there and will have to keep running to be able to provide the services to the users? And that will define also what is the governance model that we need, depending on what has to be sustained. Then what is the best legal entity that will support this governance? And at the moment, we're still far from the decision, but it looks very promising that the new model that the commission put in place last year, the EDIC, could be one of the best choices for this, but it's still uh, it's, it's long, it's, it has to be many discussions before we, we get to a decision. And at the end of the day, decision will come from the country. So it's, it's the country who has to decide what is the model for that. And the last, uh, a question they have to answer is how much it will cost and how it will be paid. That's the business model. 
and, and that's also quite critical for an infrastructure to, to be operational long time. Um, and that's why we have here in this pillar uh, representatives from the different member states that are taking part in the projects uh, to ensure that the discussions are meaningful and that we can prepare the, the, the work for the ministries to decide uh, when we are ready to go. Uh, that's pillar one. In pillar two is, is actually where most of the resources are, are uh, allocated is around 35 million, so the 40 million are here just to ensure that we can deploy the, the national nodes and connect them. And as I said before, we are doing this based on the outputs of the, of the B1G project, so the OnePlus City Trans Framework, on the current proof of concept that we have been able to demonstrate with synthetic data. So, and there is some video there where you can see also how this is working for rare diseases. Uh, there is the rare disease and the cancer one that is uh, still to be finished, but it's quite advanced at the moment. And then we also use the technical roadmap that has been created to define the components of the infrastructure. And the idea is that all of this will allow us to, in 2026, to have these six countries that are connected and that can start to showcase how data can be assessed, analyzed, and deposited in the infrastructure. Uh, so again, this is the, the architecture. So basically, the most important thing that I highlight in there is that we are based on open standards that are at the bottom. Uh, they are for year for year standards, but many of these solutions are coming from Europe. Uh, and then we have all the reference implementations that have been used for many years in, to provide access to genomic data. And, and these reference implementation are open source solutions that people can use and adapt. Um, so the way that we are going to proceed in the project is we are creating this, what we call the starter kit, that basically is the is a, is a completion of software and data that will fulfill the requirements and it will be uh, incremental versions that will be released. The first version will be released in June and, and will be uh, able to, anyone will be able to access that code and the data that is there because there will be around 3000 synthetic genomes that people can access and phenotypic, associated phenotypic data uh, to test their infrastructure to, to check if they have the capacity in the, at the technical level, uh, but also at the human, at the, the skill levels to run this type of infrastructure. This will be the first release, as I said, will be in June this year. And then they will also use this to get to gather feedback and to see what are the uh, things that still we have to improve to, to be able before we can enter into, into production. Um, the components are here. So this are, these are the initial components. They are very well known for people in genomics. Uh, some of them uh, can be used in other domains uh, are not too different for uh, components that will you find others. So others are quite specific for genomics. Um, but this is just the initial list of components that will be included in the first release in June. Um, so apart from that, Pillar 2, we have two uh, forward packets. The first one is looking at helping the countries and the nodes to progress from the initial stage to the most advanced stage, the operational one. This uh, work package four is focused on the repair level operations, we, where we will create the user portal, the data catalog, and the data access, the access management process will be accessible through there. And there will be a help desk for the users to, to be able to get assistance. And then this technical outreach and data management also as part of the pillar two. The next pillar is pillar three, and here is where we are going to look at the things that the infrastructure can not solve up, up today. So we have here two work packages, work packages seven, where we have the use cases uh, that will come with their needs, and this, and the, and then we will check if, if the needs that they have can be solved with the current infrastructure. There is new services that are required, and that's, if there is new services that are required, that will be the, the question for work packages eight to make recommendation on what will be the components that has to be added to the infrastructure and to the starter kit to be released to the countries uh, in order to provide the functionality that they're needed by the use cases. One of the first things that WordPack says is going to look at is uh, how to enable federated learning in this federated infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> and, but then we are not in, in isolation. Uh, it's not only the data spaces. We have these three initiatives that are already in this domain uh, has already started our initiative, the one plus NG, but we have also the European Data Space and the European Cancer Image, and, and it could be that there are other comings. And we also need to look at and interpret it not only within the infrastructure that are close to us, but also with other infrastructure where it's data that we can need. 
and that creates an, a number of challenges uh, um, in all aspects. Some of them has been mentioned today, like the um, data quality, data interoperability, but one that probably is the most critical is the interoperability at the governance level. So how we can, if we can move data across or um, software across data spaces, how, how we will enable that when we have different data spaces with different governance, that's a question that we need to answer and how we can we are able to link that information. Um, and then, yeah, the governance and infrastructure is, is, is a complex concept because most of what we see is that many countries they see, particularly in the domain, uh, they don't see this as, as individual infrastructure. They will see more this as a single infrastructure at the national level. And, and that still have to be discussed how these different initiatives will be implemented in each country. Um, so to try to answer these questions, we put forward a use case on cancer, uh, on cancer that is at the moment is used to connect these three projects, the one and the European and the Data Infrastructure and the European Data Space, to try to answer the challenge on combining not only genomic and phenotypic information, but also socioeconomic information, and to interact with the data and also the European Data Space. And, and this, this, this use case will help us to find some of the solutions to our questions. And, and most of these companies will also, one way or another, be part of the European Cancer Image Initiative. Um, so finally, this is the list of countries that are at the moment taking part in the project. Uh, the initial list of 15 countries are the ones that are aiming to be fully operational before, before the end of the project. We have three countries that are aiming to be on deployment. That means that they will have the national nodes, but they will still have some work to do before they can connect to the infrastructure. And then uh, two additional countries that will expect to reach, reach the, the boarding level where they will be able to connect with infrastructure to start to build capacity at the national level before they can move into deployment. In addition to this, we are also working with another three countries that we hope to bring into the project in the coming months, but we need to wait a bit and see uh, how things evolve. Um, I think uh, that's almost the last slide. It has the links to different projects uh, and the registration in case you want to be interested to become a stakeholder. Um, and the list of the partners, current partners, in the consortia that, as I mentioned, will change with the new additions that we plan in the in the coming months. Uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much, Juan. Very impressive what you have already achieved. And yes, please, as Juan just said, please reach out to him in case uh, you want to be connected to the to the project. Um, so yes, thank you, Sylvia, once more, and also thank you, Dolores, for your presentations. Uh, I don't know whether we still have Boris with us um, in this uh, inside series um, for for the Q and A, because indeed we have a lot of questions that um, are dedicated to the value of uh, to creating value with data spaces. So Arturo Kari from um, the HealthX Data Loft asks, how can the data space owner ensure that complementers create value? in line with public interest and not just follow their own economically motivated interests. So I don't know whether mm. you could take this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> I mean, in the end, um, let's face it. I mean, the, the best models are the voluntary ones. And of course, um, it must be made sure that let's say the voluntary uh, ambition of a group to form an ecosystem exceeds um, the particular interests of individual stakeholders. I think there are a couple of design principles that make sure that, let's say, um, likelihood is high that this prevails. Openness is something. Um, also, governance rules for the participation and the work in a data space, but also governance rules on data. And these rules must be checked. I mean, in the end, if we consider a data space really as, a, as an infrastructure for a data ecosystem, and we make the analogy for um, to other infrastructures that we know, for example, the road network or a railway network or so, and in particular, if we look into the motorway system in, in, in Europe, well, I mean, there is the infrastructure where cars and buses and, and trucks drive on. But um, there is also, of course, a certain code of conduct, right? Um, in Germany, it's called Straßenverkehrsordnung, so which basically says what you're allowed to do um, when you are on a motorway and what you aren't allowed to do. 
So the rules of the game need to be specified. And of course, there is always also a motorway police, a pol police in place, right? So somebody has to also make sure um, that the rules are enforced. And that is something that we probably also need in, in every data space uh, so that let's say the ecosystem can prosper, um, that everybody sticks to the rules and that um, participants that don't do that are also expelled. Thank you very much. Then we have another interesting question um, of Mr. Fervayen. What would you see as the biggest advantage of data spaces vis-a-vis -vis other systems of data sharing from a value creation perspective? Uh, for example, mm. is the design of data spaces more efficient or cheaper, or does the consume uh, does uh, does it consume less energy? Yeah, I mean, there are, let's say from a technical and architecture point of view, there are way easier options available. Um, for example, a central platform. <laughs> you could dump all the data in one place and have one player um, governing everything and it would be way easier, it would be faster. And yeah, so it comes with lots of advantages. However, exactly this concentration of power and the center of gravity in terms of data pooling and also um, governance power is what we don't want. And that is why we um, would like to go a more federated, a distributed way, which of course comes with a certain technical overhead. Um, we have connectors that can basically check policies and to a certain extent even enforce them. We have um, identity management to be put into place in order to create trust. We have a catalog function and all these kinds of things. And that's, let's say, well, let's face it, it's on top services and some, somebody has to pay for it. And in the end, um, the payer is the end user of the services that are offered through the data space. So now you can ask, is it worth it? Well, I mean, that is something that everybody, um, every everyone has to basically a look at from an individual's standpoint. And what must be clear that the benefit that we gain and the benefit is through the trustful data sharing, I can reduce my cost, I can innov innovate. What I can't do if I follow a different path, either because it's not available, second, not allowed, uh, seen, not trustworthy, but this value that I get must pay all this overhead. And we need to make sure that this is always understood because somebody has to pay the bill. <laughs> it's as easy as that. And um, we need to, and that's also why this, this discussion about business models, business cases, and the value is so important because in the end, this question will be rather sooner than later on the table. Because if we, let's say, put these data spaces into production um, mode, um, well, there is a service provider who runs all the services and they want to be paid, right? They will send, let's say, and um, Juan said that, perhaps an edict, they will send a bill to the edict. Well, and what do you do with it? And do you send it to the, to the government and say, look, this is similar like the motorway, please do pay for that because you would also do pay for the motorway. Or basically, do you transfer it into service fees and so on and so forth? But this logic is very, very important. This maybe leads also nicely over to the topic of our next insight series, which is on the value of data. So yeah, please sign up for this as soon as uh, we have the registration open. It will happen end of April. As, um, next March, we will have the um, Data Spaces Symposium in, in The Hague. So, and as um, yeah, we don't want to um, keep you waiting and also don't want to close late this uh, Insight series. I would like to say once more thank you very much for the great presentations uh, today. Thank you for thank you to Sylvia, Juan, and Dolores for joining today as our special guests, so to say. Uh, and looking forward to seeing you um, in The Hague. Bye bye. Thank you. See you bye. in The Hague. Bye bye. Looking bye. forward to it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.